All right, well, we've got some good stuff here now. Ian Wallace is here. He's a professional dream psychologist and author. And here is, first of all, Tim Smith no, doing an impression. Doing I'm not doing it anymore. Not because Ian's here. I'm not going to do it. Oh, Steve. <laughs> It's uncanny. It term. really is. I thought I was talking there for a moment. I'd just so like to I. say I do it under duress and I apologise. Yeah. It's a lovely voice, though, uh, Tim. He's analysed tens of thousands of dreams during his career <laughs> and regularly appears on television and radio shows in the United Kingdom and around the world. Ian says that exploring our dreams is the most powerful way to understand what we want out of life and how we can achieve it. So first up, Ian, how are you? I'm very good. How are you guys? Very good. We're very good. Thank you. We got an email from Tom Noble. Hi, Ian, says Tom. I am English and I'm married to my wife who has Polish family one generation up. I've recently been dreaming in Polish and can't understand it. In my dreams, I speak fluent Polish, but can only mutter a few words of the language whilst awake and in real life. Well, that's fascinating. Why does this happen? And can it be explained? Yes, it can be explained. And any time we dream that we're speaking in a foreign language, it's quite a common dream. It's about the ability to express your unknown self-potential. So what Tom has in waking life is the opportunity to articulate some of his true feelings, some of his deeper feelings about a particular situation. And he needs to show those feelings openly, even though they might seem a bit foreign to him. So that's the Polish part. So instead of playing it safe in his comfort zone, Tom needs to speak from his heart and really show how he feels about a situation in waking life. That's interesting that he says he thinks in his dream that he's speaking fluent Polish. I mean, he doesn't know that for sure. That's just his perception, right? Yeah, so when we dream, it's not like we're just lying there passive. Our brain is incredibly active. And really the only part of the brain that's not active is the visual cortex that interprets vision. But his language centres will be active and they will be continually generating feelings and images. And that's what he's picking up on. That seems very, very fluent to him. So his imagination is very fluent. So it's not that deep down inside he can actually speak fluent Polish? No, but I'm sure there might be some Channel 4 or Channel 5 show that would take him to Poland and just try out and see if he could do that. (laughs) Thank you for that. (laughs) All right. Karen Coates in Liverpool, how are you? Fine, thank you, Steve. Very good. Good afternoon to you. Now, what was your dream? Ian is listening. Oh, this was so vivid. Sound, smell, feeling, everything. I'm in a Roman amphitheatre, baking hot. I can smell all the blood and the sweat and the soil. I'm a female gladiator with a leather breastplate with a long dagger in my right hand. I can hear the crowd, they're murmuring, you know, like before a concert starts and you get that low murmuring sound. And then the adrenaline starts to build up and it's a fight or flight feeling. But I look towards across the arena and there are lions waiting to be released out of the cage. And there's one lioness who makes eye contact with me. But I feel this feeling of power comes over me, almost euphoric. It's like what I was meant to do. Wow. And then as the noise builds up and they're about to release the lions, yeah. pig sick, I wake up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but, I've, but I've got my arm in the air with my jagger ready to go. So that was the dream, and it was so strong and so powerful. Well, putting the dream aside, I think you're the caller of the year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the dream of the year. Yes. With the dream of the year. Wow. And uh, you say it was very, very vivid, and, and clearly you've remembered every detail. Yeah, it was so strong, I had to write it down, and I still get the vision. Wow, Karen. Well, let's hear what Ian has to say about that. Karen, this is a wonderful dream. So the way we work with dreams, Karen, as you know, is we work with the images, and what a Roman amphitheatre symbolises is a situation in your waking life where you've got the opportunity to confidently place your talent centre stage and be recognised by a wide range of people. Caged lions, Karen, they represent that you take great pride in your talents and displaying your abilities, but you sometimes hold back and you feel that you need permission to perform and unlock your potential. The dagger shows that you've got the power to unleash your talent and be really proud of what you do. And the lioness that you make contact with in the dream is you realising that you have that lion instinct that's going to enable you to work with your power and really use it. Uh, Wow. (laughs) But the fact is that she woke up before the action. Mm, Any significance in that? Yeah, what we do in the dream, as it gets more and more vivid, as in Karen's dream here, then it'll come to a natural end. It's like a story. Mm. So this is the setup. This is like the backstory, Karen, for some situation in your waking life where you have to thrust yourself forward, like with that dagger, and unleash your power and unlock your potential. So that's why the dream ends there. It's perfectly logical. All right, listen, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now. Hello, Penny. Hi. How are you? I'm well, thank you. 
you. Very good. Now you say, hello, Stephen Ian. For the last couple of years, I've had a recurring dream. What is that recurring dream, Penny? Well, I feel I should apologise straight away because I don't have any lions or amphitheatres in my dream. Oh, that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. My dream is that I'm always desperately trying to get home. It's always a different scenario. I've had flights cancelled. I've had train tickets refused. Um, I've had cars break down on me. There's always something that stops me from getting home. And it's always my sense of panic that wakes me up. And it's always a relief to wake up. Now, lots of people have this dream or similar dreams. I myself always get this dream, Penny, where I'm in London and I'm trying to get back to what I perceive as home. And then I, I get a bus or a train or something and I find myself lost, even though I know London really well. And then I find myself not knowing how to get home. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? And it's just so frustrating. It is. It is. <laughs> All right. Well, let's ask Ian. Thank you. Hi, Penny. As Steve says, this is a, a really common dream. It's actually the 32nd most common dream. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Tim told me that earlier just yeah, to yeah, yeah. Get, get me prepared yeah. for it. Yeah. And again, Penny, we're just working with symbols and imagery here. So what your home represents is yourself, where you feel most at home in your own identity. So there's some situation in waking life where you're always trying to get to that back to that true self, Penny, because you spend maybe spend most of your time trying to keep other people happy or please other people or maybe let other people make your decisions and choose your direction. So she's stopping herself. Yeah, well, it's something we all do. We all often try and look for acceptance or approval. So we try and keep other people happy rather than following our own path and having a set direction. Gotcha. That sounds so right. Yeah. <laughs> that direction or the decisions, you may be not entirely comfortable with them, Penny, or at home with them. So all these different versions of the dream, so the flights getting cancelled or ideas that you've had that have maybe never taken off. The car is about your ambition and drive. Floods are emotional change. The train ticket is permission to embark on some self-development or some idea that you have. And the rooms in the house represent aspects of yourself, Penny. So being trapped in a small room feels that you're only showing one small aspect of yourself to the people around you. So the action from the dream, Penny, is just about opening up and thinking about what you want to do and make a bit of time for yourself. And we are actually trapped in a small room in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. Yes. <laughs> no, it's a lovely dream. Lovely yes. dream. Yeah. Penny, That's thank really you. interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you have this dream quite a lot, yeah? I've had it probably for the last two years, but it seems to be more frequent of late. Well, get yourself sorted out. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Bye. Penny, for being on. We've got an email next uh, for Ian from Gavin Williams. It says, hi, Ian. In my dream, I realised I was in a dream and I created some kind of idyllic countryside paradise for myself and some of my closest mates. We were all sat in a tree waiting for some sort of split in reality to appear so I could let my other dreams know they were only dreams and not real. Let the other are, dreams know. Are you following this? It sounds like a Stephen Moffat script. <laughs> I was trying to get through to a zombie dream that turned into a nightmare. I tried to let them know it wasn't real and that they could control it. It's the weirdest dream I've ever had, says Gavin, really, and I remember a lot of my dreams. This one comes on the back of weeks of having dreams within dreams and sleeping a lot more than usual. Not. Dream within a dream, yeah, a zombie dream. within a zombie. Yeah. Where do you want to start Never with that, ending Ian? or beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just begin here then. This is a classic example of lucid dreaming where you become aware that you're dreaming. And it shows the richness of Gavin's creative processes and also his cognitive abilities. His mates symbolise his untapped self-potential that he's becoming more acquainted with. And the zombie dream, the zombie part of it, symbolises a situation in his waking life where he's just kind of going through the motions, his heart's not in it, it's maybe a kind of soulless thing that he's doing. So what he's trying to do here is just send himself that message. And the fact that he's been dreaming lots and lots suggests that beforehand he's not been sleeping that well, he's maybe having fragmented sleep. Is that st still sleep? I mean, you know when you say, OK, how many hours sleep did you have? I'll say to Tim, how many hours sleep? And you say, well, I had six. I mean, if he's in that dream state, does that count as sleep? It's still sleep, but if you sleep for, say, seven and a half, eight hours per night, you will have five sleep cycles of about 90 minutes. And in the first sleep cycle, you maybe dream for about 10, 15 minutes, and in the final one for about 40 minutes. So of that seven and a half, eight hours sleep, you will dream for about two hours. And that's what's happening with Gavin here. Fantastic. Thank you, as ever, for your insight into our dreams. Ian Wallace will return to this show in 2017. Meanwhile, we're dreaming of a white Christmas. Ian Wallace, everybody. Thank you, Ian. Thank you.
Thank you. See what I did at the end there about the dreams? It's a gift.